Good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Robertson. I'm an FCCT board member, and I want to welcome you to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand uh, to hear uh, this tonight's panel about the Philippines. Um, the Marcos Redux, puzzling out Philippines election and politics. <clears throat> but before we get into the actual panel, uh, let me take a few moments to update you about some other events that are coming up at the club. Um, uh, tomorrow, the 31st of May, we have a panel on Thai economy, stirred but not shaken, talking about where the economy is going. I know that uh, the situation is still quite dire, both in Bangkok and the provinces, is trying to recover from the COVID situation. We'll have uh, speakers from uh, the Thai Development Research Institute. We'll have the World Bank country manager from Thailand. We'll have uh, a senior person from Kasikon Private Bank, and Gwen Robinson will be moderating. <coughs> um, on uh, June 2nd, Thursday, June 2nd, later this week, we're going to have a discussion of Thailand's Me Too moment. moment the politics of sexual assault. Uh, this is actually, as many of you know, uh, there's been uh, a major controversy involving one of the major political parties uh, and uh, one of their leaders, Prin Panichipak. Uh, and to discuss this, uh, we will have a panel of uh, leading women involved in the Me Too movement talking about what this means. On Monday, the 6th of June, uh, we will have a, a an event that is being held by the Cross-Cultural Foundation talking about Thailand land of surveillance from forced disappearances to electronic monitoring and digital and biometric surveillance. So for those of you who are concerned about that, please do sh show up. And the 8th of June in the morning, uh, we will have uh, another outside event, learning from uh, USAID's uh, counter-trafficking in persons project. And so there'll be a uh, a, a morning session about trafficking in persons. I would also like to say as the uh, <clears throat> uh, manager of the FCCT pool tournament uh, that we do have a pool table in the back. Uh, we are now going to have a pool tournament uh, which is open to members of the club and staff. And uh, you're in invited to sign up for the pool tournament and we'll uh, be coming out with further details in the near future. So, um, on tonight's panel, um, as you know, on, on, <clears throat> on May 9th, the Philippines elected a new president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., um, which was a big surprise, I think, to people outside of the Philippines who weren't paying attention to what was going on. This comes a full 36 years after his father had to flee the country to escape the pressure of the People Power Revolution of February 1986. And uh, he left behind a record of martial law, serious rights abuses, huge amounts of corruption, debt. But apparently, as a result of the election that took place on May 9th, um, he's, uh, his son, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is going to be the new president of the Philippines. And I think that election result has boggled the mind of, minds of many observers, particularly those outside the Philippines who may not have been paying attention to what was going on. So we're going to learn tonight how did this happen and why? And what did Marcos have to offer to so many Filipino voters who support him despite his unwillingness to articulate issues and policies beyond building unity? And where did the other candidates go wrong? And what does this mean for the future of the Philippines? Uh, we have a, a, a very, very prestigious panel uh, of experts uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, just before they speak. We're going to have each of them uh, <coughs> give a presentation, and then we'll have time uh, for a question and answer afterwards. Uh, joining us uh, from Manila, we're very lucky to have uh, Richard Hedarian. He's one of the most prolific and astute commentators on the politics of the Philippines. He's a frequent uh, contributor to the world's major media outlets. He's also the author of uh, the Indo-Pacific, Trump, China, and the New Struggle for the Global Master. And he's a professor chairholder of geopolitics at the Polytechnical University of the Philippines. So I'm going to ask him first to start. So Richard, uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much, uh, Phil, for that uh, kind introduction. Now suddenly I feel so lonely uh, seeing all of you guys there, <laughs> and I'm the only one on the screen. I thought uh, it's going to be a couple of us joining from all around the world. I can hear also you guys. Uh, it looks like I'm going to be the intermission number while you're uh, digesting and enjoying your dinner. I'm not sure that's the best thing, but I'll do my best to make sure I don't disrupt your digestion while covering the Philippines' often macabre uh, politics. So I'll try to make three key points here uh, in order to make sense out of the situation, but I'm sure my fellow panelists are in a great position to also shed light on the different aspects of this. As Phil already mentioned, you know, I, by the way, I have a book also on Duterte. If you read my book on Duterte, you will not be surprised at all with Marcos, and you can guess what is my next book project. Um, so I'm try, I'll try to discuss that. By the way, can I do screen sharing? Am I allowed to do that? Who's, sorry. Yes, I mean, you can, if you want I mean, if you want to do some, you share the screen, you can. Yeah, I will have to show you some data, first of all, uh, so that that will be I'm helpful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you go okay? ahead. All right, okay, I'll share it shortly. Let me first uh, discuss how I approach these elections. Uh, I know that many people are shocked, surprised, but for me, as shocking as it was, it was completely unsurprising. And one way to actually understand it, and perhaps the best way to understand what happened uh, in May election in the Philippines this year is counter-revolution, right? This is something that has been happening since the French Revolution. So from the very beginning of modern history, we have seen the advent of Anshan regime, the remnants of former reactionary conservative far-right regime, climbing their way, clawing their way back to power. We saw that with Bourbons, we saw a different version of that with Napoleon, Napoleon III, for instance, hence what Marx said first as tragedy, then as comedy, uh, then as farce. And we have seen many versions of that all around the world over the past two, two centuries or so. And by the way, Ferdinand Marcos is also not the first uh, offspring of a former dictator uh, or a former strongman, however you want to put it, who have taken a top position in government. So we have in Korea, Park Yung he who few years ago actually was in charge before she was of course impeached. We also had uh, in the case of, of Megawati, in the case of Indonesia, the daughter of former strongman uh, Sukarno. Of course, Sukarno is not as controversial perhaps as Soharto in certain ways, but he was a strongman nonetheless. He was the master popular of the early era of independent Indonesia. So in that case, Marcos is in a kind of a, I won't say good company, but he comes in not as necessarily the, the, you know, kind of a new aberration. This aberration has been going on for quite some time, if you want to see it as an aberration. And, and the thing is this, um, the Marcoses have been knocking at the doors of Malacanang since ever. In fact, only after a few years of spending luxurious exile in Hawaii, thanks to the Reagan administration's patronage, they went back to the Philippines in 1991. And in fact, in 1992, had Imelda Marcos did not, had she not split the votes with Danding Coango, who was the top crony of, um, of Marcos and a relative of the Aquinos, their Betenois, uh, they could have captured actually the presidency as early as 1992. So our president in 1992, the eventual winner, Ramos, only had 23% of the votes. Had Imelda and Danding put their numbers together, they would have gotten 28% of the votes. So the Philippines democratic project has always been vulnerable from the very onset. The democracy that we kind of was given on a silver platter to us by the Americans from 1946 to 1971, that proved extremely fragile. So by 1969, Marcos became the father, became the first one to win re-election. years later, he declared martial law. It was supported by a lot of Filipinos, including the elite, the business community, among others, because the Philippines was a dysfunctional democracy in the 1960s. The Congress was passing barely any new laws. The Supreme Court was slipping on its job. So it became very easy for Marcos, especially in the climate of fear and paranoia and Cold War, to declare martial law. Once again, we had another chance at democracy, but if you look at it, this democracy also has failed on very fundamental levels. In fact, that's how I understood the rise of Duterte six, seven years ago. Uh, if you look at the Philippines, the political dynasties in these countries, their grip on positions of power, elected offices, actually tightened over the last three decades. So from around 60% in 1987 to more than 80% in 2013. So this is before Duterte, by the way. So for our liberal friends who want to blame it all on Duterte and all, you have to understand it from the perspective of an average voter or a median voter. For them, 
This was not a democracy. This made a mockery out of democracy. But look at the economy, for instance. In 2011, when the Philippine economy was actually picking up, this is under the late President Aquino, 40 richest families on the Forbes list took home 76% of newly created growth. That's more than 4% out of 6.2, 6.3% growth that we have been experiencing. That is why vast majority of Filipinos did not feel invested in the Philippine democracy or whatever you want to call it, oligarchy, liberal oligarchy, etc. That is why we have had the advent of what you call, or what some scholars call, um, democratic ambivalence. So let me just show you some numbers on how horribly yeah, ambivalent. Yeah. Go ahead and share this. Go in here and yeah, yeah, share the screen for sure. One second, sorry. Um, sorry, I, this is the downside of being overactive. My screen is like a million things are here. Uh, okay, yeah, let me show you these numbers. This is crazy, I mean, look at it. So let me make this bigger. So look at these numbers. This is in early 2010s. This is from Monk and Fon Journal of Democracy. By the way, I have a piece coming up in Journal of Democracy on this counter revolution. So hopefully you'll have a copy of that soon later this year. Uh, so if you look at it, when people were asked, this is a world value survey. Do you prefer a strong leader who does not have to bother with elections? Close to 60% of Filipinos were okay with that. This is before Duterte. This is during the time of President Aquino. Look at these numbers, for instance. Sorry for the bad quality here. Again, they, uh, they asked, do you want a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with essentially checks and balances, institutional checks and balances? Look at the numbers in the Philippines. So if you look at it, it's actually very bad. So only 15% of Filipinos have expressed total commitment to what we call a liberal democracy, civil liberties, human rights, institutional checks and balances. Around similar numbers, 10 to 15%, want authoritarian leaders. So I call them the loyalist base. This is the base of the Marcoses, more or less. But 67% of Filipinos have been ambivalent, right? And, and Filipinos are ideologically, let's call them agnostic, right? They want governments that deliver. And that is why they more or less gave up on whatever you want to call it, liberal democracy and the liberal and the opposition, et cetera. So this was what Lenny Robredo, the opposition, was up against. She couldn't only rely on her base, the liberal base, she had to win significant number of people here. So both sides, that's why I define politics as the contest between two minorities for the acquiescence, acquiescence of the silent majority, this side did better than this side. And that trend line has been going on since Duterte has essentially come uh, uh, into power. Now, obviously I said this election is gonna be extremely important because after six years of Duterte's presidency, the foundations of the Philippines democratic institutions have been severely undermined. Phil and our friends have covered the massive extrajudicial killings, the mockery of our judicial institutions, the politicization of the Congress, of the judicial institutions, of the bureaucracy, some would even say the military, although I have my disagreements on that. So that is why when, when you know, that's why this election was very important because whoever wins this election will be in a very strong position to do whatever they want. Let me just, but nonetheless, let me clarify a number of uh, misconceptions that I think some of our friends have. So one of the misconceptions is that this election was really about young people not doing their due diligence and essentially giving, handing it to the Marcoses because you know they were not born during that era, so they easily fell for Marcos. But actually, if you look at the data, it's, it's much more ambivalent. So actually in 2016, one reason Marcos did not win so is because the youth, so the youth here is 18 to 34 blue. The youth did not rally behind him in 2016. This is actually my generation, millennial, older millennials and older Gen Z. Uh, the ones that rallied behind Marcos were actually the older generation, 55 and older. So what do you call this? You call this nostalgia. This is a clear case of authoritarian nostalgia. So this nostalgia has been going on for a long time. This is among the middle class. This is among the older Filipinos. Uh, who felt, you know, we know how nostalgia works. You're frustrated with your partner today or your situation today. You suddenly have a romanticized version of the past. That's exactly what happened in the Philippines. Now, nonetheless, Marcos loses in 2016. Millennials do, don't, do not rally behind him. They rally behind Escudero and Lenny Robredo. But in the last six years, he made adjustment in his strategy, therefore, and leveraging TikTok, other platforms, he really curated himself to win over the Gen Z generation. So he made an adjustment. So to say the youth per se is pro-authoritarian or something like that misses the point because six years ago, that was not the case. 
Marcos adjusted his strategy, he was more successful this time. Now, people, there are also people who say that, oh, okay, this is only about, you know, the middle class is Lenny. You go to, you know, more educated, they're Lenny, and the less educated are supposedly on the other side. Well, the problem is this. First of all, the ABC, the, the class that I belong to, especially A and B, right? It's, it's irrelevant. It's demographically irrelevant as far as number of votes is concerned. So practically, it's really the D, the urban poor, and upper D, right? People are overlapping with C, which is the new middle class, who are essentially the, where the numbers are coming from. So whether it's Len is 15 million, whether it's Marcos 31 million, whether it's Duterte 16 million, vast majority of that is really from here, class D. So to say it's really A, A B, C versus D, and A, you just, you don't know what you're talking about. The numbers are very clear. These are the people who decide what happens in the country. The same people made Lenny win in 2016. The same people made, you know, I mean, the same class made Aquino's presidency possible. So to denigrate them and say, it's their fault that the Marcuses are back, you forget that they're the reason why you were there in power to begin with in previous years. And that's where I get a lot of problems with some of the elitist statements that are coming from some of the folks. And look at these numbers. I mean, the middle class and national capital region, which is the most developed part of the Phil Philippines, Manila, where 40% of the GDP is, they are pro-Marcos. They're, they're pro-Sara, right? So, and in fact, in 2016, when Marcos was behind and picking up, he got the biggest support among ABC, which is the most educated Filipinos. And this is what we call the politics of discipline, right? Because a lot of Filipinos are suffering from what I call Singapore envy. The most cited political figure in the Philippines is not Duterte. I don't know if you can even cite him. Uh, it's hard to really transcribe him. Nor Marcos Jr., not even Marcos Sr. The most cited person in the Philippines is actually Lee Kuan Yew. And both sides, all classes in one way or another, discuss Lee Kuan Yew. And the idea is very simple, right? Democracy creates dysfunction, disorder, or doesn't bring, bring about sufficient rule of law and stability for us to have that beautiful skyscrapers, for us to have those beautiful uh, economic growth, etc. Now, Philippines have, we have our own small versions of Singapore, like BGC, for instance. And people are saying, maybe let's be like that. Let's rule our country as if the same way that our oligarchs rule their big malls and beautiful skyscrapers and areas like that. Some restrictions on our basic freedoms, but if we get prosperity, so be it. So these are some of the things that I think are completely missed when we discuss only the horrors of illiberalism, only the, I mean, as important as it is, the, the bad side, the dark side of the Marcoses or, or Duterte's, et cetera. We have to understand why the majority of Filipino people have given up on what we call liberal democracy, or why the Philippines is more and more vulnerable to become what I call a hybrid regime, which is the latter part. And I'm trying, I'll try to end here. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. Let me discuss also at this point. So where are we going to head here? Uh, I think the most likely outcome, and by the way, let's be very clear. This is not only a Marcos administration, it's a Marcos Duterte administration. Mm. And if had Sara Duterte decided to run for the presidency last year, I believe Marcos would not have been in the equation at all. He would have dropped out. Sara Duterte could have been our president easily right now. So it's a combination of those two houses which, comb uh, which, which tells you something about the coming administration. And much will also depend about vis-a-vis uh, -vis the internal dynamics of those two major political families. So far, Marcos is winning the day. He rejected Sara's call for getting the Department of National Defense. But Sara has a lot of support in the legislature, in the other branches of the government. Let's see how they'll fight back. But these two families, both illiberal, both have common enemies and liberals and opposition, they will have to work it out. Now, what is the most likely outcome for the Philippines? Again, I don't have a crystal ball. But I think looking at what happened over the past six years, if that's a prelude for where we're heading, I think the difference will be this. Duterte had the guts. Duterte had the shamelessness and unabashedness, but he lacked discipline. And he's quite advanced age, not the healthiest guy. I mean, I've met Mahathir 20 years older than Duterte, incomparable. Mahathir can easily stand up, has a better hair than me, so on and so forth. Duterte, a very different picture. But now this Marcos Duterte administration will be in a position to change the constitution in, the way, in ways that Duterte was not. And should a constitutional change happen, which is more and more probable and likely, we don't know it's parliamentary federal, presidential federal, that will be the next fight. But most likely the Philippines could become what political scientists call a hybrid regime. Now, if you want to understand where the Philippines is heading, look at today's Hungary under Orban, or look at Turkey under Erdogan. They have elections, semi-competitive elections. The opposition gives some fight, but we know who's going to win the elections at the end of the day, right? Uh, you have media, 
but the media has been infiltrated by oligarchs aligned to the government or social media disinformation networks completely crowd out independent media, right, directly, or sometimes a combination of those two. I think that's a very likely scenario for the Philippines in the coming years. There's a lot I want to say, but I'm sure we have other panelists, and I'm sure there's a lot of question and answer. So I hope that just teased you guys into the kind of conversation we want to have later on today. Thank you very much. Richard, thank you very much. That, that's, that's absolutely great. A great, great way to kick off the panel. Um, we will definitely have time for question and answer, so please hang in with us here. Um, next, I want to ask uh, Joanna Son, uh, who's based in Bangkok. She's the editor and the founder of Reporting ASEAN, which is a news site focused on in-depth reportage of Southeast Asian regional perspective. And she's reported for the region for three decades, contributing to many publications. Um, I want to turn the tape yeah. over to you. Yeah, so good evening to everybody. Um, I was just remembering that after the 2016 elections, I was here too. <laughs> and like, uh, hmm. But uh, well, six years later, um, it's kind of a different story, but also not quite a different story exactly. Um, I wanted to start by saying that uh, this year is actually also the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Martial Law, and also the 50th year since the Philippines started a state-sponsored uh, labor exports, which is why you see Filipinos everywhere. And at the time, it was designed as a stopgap measure by the Marcos government, uh, given the economic pressures. And what was supposed to be temporary has become permanent. Um, now the Philippines actually, I probably is the only country in the world that has a department of migrant workers, for example, with about 10% of the population abroad. Um, uh, so that's a bit for context. Uh, I also wanted to say that uh, while a lot of people might be surprised or shocked or whatever it is, I mean, there's a lot of uh, grieving going on in some quarters in the Philippines. Um, even if a lot of people saw it coming. And um, I think for some of us for whom this is lived experience really, um, there, there is of course a meaning that we put to it in, on, in those years, right? Um, which includes me. So I was saying to Phil when we spoke, right, that like um, the younger Marcos's voice sounds a lot like the father. So to us, we, when we hear that voice, we know who it is, which I suppose naturally younger people wouldn't necessarily know. And although in many ways uh, the younger Marcos was trying to at some point project his own person, the way he, you know, the colors of the campaign, uh, the songs, some of the campaign, and the way he wears his shirt, the shirt jack, that is vintage Ferdinand Marcos Sr. So those are, uh, you know, kind of the, the non-verbal things that in, in the messaging as well. Um, so I wanted to say also that the polarization is such that after the elections, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, been a lot of unfriending of people, even among families, mm. like of kids who said to their parents, how could you kind of thing. And uh, anyway, so it, it, it goes um, that deep as well. And I think they're on both sides, but you could say maybe more on the Robredo side, that people are kind of looking for people to blame, so to, so, so to speak, no? or somebody or something to blame. But life is not mm, that linear, of course. And I think that the elections are a big are an opportunity and are maybe a question that Filipinos need to explore about them, uh, lead to questions that they should explore about themselves. So first I wanted to maybe just show a few figures again, but different ones. Can we show yeah, them? It's right there, it's already up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> so this is something I did before the elections just to kind of brief people where we are. So the Philippines is the second, lar second most populous country in ASEAN. It's a huge country, uh, 110 people, right? And then these are just some of the figures to show you that um, it's a, it was a huge field. That's 10 candidates for president, nine for vice president. That's a, a big menu to choose from. Uh, you have 65, over 65 million registered voters. The final, uh, I saw somebody, 
somebody from the commission elections give that figure of like, uh, uh, it was that high already in 2016, 82%. It was more than 83% this time. So uh, it's not exactly that Filipinos are tired of voting to the voting booths, unlike some countries at some point. Um, but, uh, and also this thing about uh, how many people are younger, are in the younger age bracket. If you narrow that figure further down to like up born after, uh, after 1986, that becomes uh, a little smaller. The other figures I wanted to show, just to show that one, it's very dependent on global remittances from overseas, uh, globally. It's always been like this. So you would say now for 50 years. Uh, and then there's high income disparity, which hasn't fallen much. Uh, there is a high perception of self-poverty. 43% of Filipinos consider themselves poor. That's done by an independent polling agency. Uh, so it's called self-rated poverty. And then um, the score on issues like corruption is very low. Um, low on the index, I mean high on corruption perceptions. Also very low scoring when it comes to perception of the rule of law. So uh, the GDP, of course, is one indicator. But as we know, that doesn't say a whole lot about equity and, and all of those other issues. I put in the social media hours daily because I think it's quite something uh, to, to see that. Uh, and I think because that's uh, definitely a factor in, in, in this election. So that's kind of what we are like, right? So um, next one I wanted to go into a bit of the, I mean, many, many reasons have been said and shared um, I will try maybe just to focus on a bit of something. I mean, I think um, now we're looking at a situation where everybody's looking at his choices of cabinet, uh, cabinet members. Uh, I don't think it's complete yet, but uh, the Vice President, Sara Duterte, will be uh, Education Secretary, although he wanted the defense portfolio. There's very little opposition. So in the Senate, now there's only going to be one uh, opposition member. Uh, so that's kind of means they ca there's a lot of political capital there and they can basically, it would be easy to push registration through. Um, and many people are like predicting, oh, he's going to do this, oh, he's going to do that. But we don't really know. I mean, and I think as journalists, we need to stop and watch and, and observe. Of course, a big question which has been referred to also is, will the coalition hold? Will the Marcos Duterte coalition hold? Because it's a meeting of interests, right? But it doesn't, it's not something that has gone on for like ages. So that has to be seen. Um, I think also that um, some people may be over dis dismiss the Marcos popularity or the chances at the start, even though the, the, servers, the surveys were showing otherwise. Um, and I think that um, we've seen some indicators that worry some people like he during the campaign he was selecting who he would talk to and who would be let in and who would not be let in and in the interview last week he chose only three outlets only one of which was um how do i say been around for some time the two are affiliated to his supporters or duterte supporters so um, that's uh, one of it. The other factor that I think has been mentioned is the combination of Ferdinand Marcos, so he's from the north, and then Sa Duterte, who are from the south. I think that uh, outsiders sometimes don't probably appreciate the weight of that formula. It's almost by default in the Philippines, and I saw an analysis of the surveys that showed that people were exp choosing a preference, basing a preference first on regionalism. Is that kind of my, my, my part of the Philippines. Um, so in many ways, that was unbeatable to combine somebody from the north and to combine somebody from, from the south. Next, I want to go into also it's some of the Philippines' old habits and patterns. And um, for that, I wanted to maybe go to the next slide. I, go ahead. Uh, sorry, which is my responsibility, yeah. So <laughs> it's, a lot of, it's a lot of text, sorry, but I couldn't find another way to show you that uh, 
in many ways it's uh, surprising but in many ways more ways maybe it's not so if i start from the left so i called it family affairs so you see that there are a number of surnames that pop up again and again and again so before marcos and then marcos years and then we had uh, i just put like some major events on the left and then you see uh, so Marcos was there from 65 to 86, right? And then after he went into exile, it was uh, President e Cory Aquino, who I did not put in the list, sorry. And then um, that was after the assassination of her husband, Benigno Aquino, right? And then Marcos died. He's, they were allowed to come back in 1991. And then actually Imelda ran for president. Uh, I think I have the rear wrong. Hmm. Then he, she withdrew. But uh, if you look, so there are many Marcoses there, and I, uh, I, this Marcos and his sister, they've actually been swapping positions as either representative of the, the district in the north, which is the province is Ilocos Norte, or governor. So there's always been, they have been in the picture since they returned, right? And then, but now, that now Marcos is 64, so he has children. So his son, who is the third, Ferdinand Marcos the third just won a congressional seat in the north. Uh, I'm his son, so this guy's cousin, was just re-elected governor of Ilocos Norte. So it has really been generational too. And then Duterte, apart from now, Sarah is vice president after him becoming president, right? So one son won as congressman, the other son is now mayor of Davao City. So if you look at the right side, you'll see maybe how many Aquino, uh, Arroyo, who is Makapagal, she's the daughter of that president there, 1961, and then Duterte. Uh, so there are how many, three, four surnames that keep popping up, right? And I put there like uh, what some of the relationships are. So of these names here, only Ramos, in a sense, didn't result in like dynasties, like his children and that children and that whoever. All the rest are there in one way or another. So if you look at uh, Joseph Estrada, for example, um, his two children are now in the Senate. So, and then uh, if you look at Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, uh, you might remember that she had been prosecuted for corruption and was, she was detained and then she was acquitted. So apart from having political lineage, so she came back to become Speaker of the House and then she had a son, her son became a congressman uh, and I think now is supposed to become a cabinet member as part of the winning formula. So, and there was an article that quoted President Duterte as saying that he has now done what he's supposed to do, which is uh, leave a legacy. And he said, he said that his legacy is now he has these kids also in public service. So, that's kind of the definition of a political legacy, if you will. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not surprising, actually. And if you look at this pattern, uh, I think then uh, the Marcos restoration, as it has been called, is not totally surprising. So the green arrows just kind of try to show where now these people, they have all gravitated towards each other. So for the last number of years, when we read articles about even social events, you'll see that it's the birthday of some, some Marcos, and who came? The Estradas came, Makapagal Arroyo came. So now there's a meeting of all these interests, including Duterte, and this is the really, really the coalition, some of which, uh, some of whose elements and some of whose characters may not be so obvious, because we see Marcos and Duterte. But uh, Gloria Makapagal Arroyo has been actually called very much so, a kingmaker in this formula, uh, in getting uh, the Marcos and Duterte team uh, together. So they're actually each other's ladders to somewhere. Um, and we have to see like how long this lasts. Um, already some of the rewards are obvious. So Gloria, uh, Gloria has been house speaker, right? So that has been her, her power base. But now she has to give way and so some people are presenting it as like uh, it's starting the the maybe some crumbling of the coalition. I I don't know, but but um, she's no longer going to be house speaker, and uh, she has said 
that she will be, she will make way for a Romualdez, who is a cousin of the president. So that is the side of Imelda Marcos family. So uh, it continues. Um, there was a study recent, I, I read about a study done by the Ateneo School of Government, which said that around 80% of governors, meaning heads of provinces, belong to what was called uh, fat dynasties, clans with two or more members in power at the same time. Compare, uh, this was in the 2019 midterm elections compared to 57% in 2004. By another study, it said that political families held 67% of seats in the House of Representatives, which is the lower house of Congress, compared with 48% in 2004. Uh, so it tells you that this is really has been a characteristic of Philippine electoral politics. Uh, by one, de, Sal, uh, one de, de La Salle University professor said that the Philippines from the, from the time under the U.S. since then, has produced 319 dynastic families. And in the 2019 midterm polls, members of at least 234 such families won positions. So um, in many ways, I guess, the, 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 the mar the, this experience in 2022 maybe looked more extreme or felt more extreme because in many ways people thought that surely it would not happen with this person given uh, such so much baggage um, in the past. The other one that is a habit is that, uh, a political habit, I think of the Philippines, is that, that political parties, they already meant little before, they mean even less today. So it's been very hard sometimes for outsiders to understand, explain this formula to me. So there are parties, political parties, that used to be anti-Ferdinand Marcos, but who are now with the Marcos coalition. There are people who are in, were in the anti-Marcos struggle, but are now running with the Marcos Duterte coalition. And I remember once being asked, can you explain to me who is left and who is right, on the left and who is on the right? But Philippine politics isn't like that either. Um, and so um, I it's strange in the sense that the template is probably different from many others. Habit also because I think political patronage has grows re has really really strong roots, and I think the externalization of uh, trying to find a savior or a Deus ex machina of sorts, mm. and um, in many ways, I was reading Anna Politskovaya's Joanna, book. Can I ask you to sort of wrap up because we're getting okay. uh, getting on on with time? Yeah. So and she was saying that uh, we need to ask the question like how Russia, for example, present a. a produced a Putin. So we could probably ask ourselves um, the same thing. I think I just want to maybe end our, uh, by speaking a bit about these attempts now to, leg to acquire legitimacy and legitimation through social media. And I think um, a lot of it, a lot of the campaign period was not around conversations. It was people, groups, trying to shout at each other. And it reminds me of what uh, the, uh, the author Elif Shafak called uh, a clashing certainties, so that there was very little of the, that inquiry about the other side, and uh, it's a lot of the othering that, that we see. And um, all the last element probably is that the entertainment element. If you looked at the YouTube, uh, TikTok videos, especially of the Marcos side, they were treated like, uh, like movie stars, almost like they were a love team, like asking, what did you like most about her? And what do you eat during the breaks kind of thing? And people, uh, I think it was very hard to counter these kinds of things. And in this age, people don't, people, uh, I read a book that said now people read like this, like just get me to the end kind of thing. You know, I don't want to know nuances and things. So um, just to wrap up, I think that there are a lot of problems ahead for the Philippines. I mean, part of uh, there's the impact of the war, there's inflation, there's a large de debt to GDP ratio now is about 63%. And I think so a lot of people are hoping that um, there's not much more harm done, if, it is, if that is possible at all. But there is also the thing that's hanging over his head, well, for some people, that is that the Marcos family has been billed 203 billion pesos in uh, estate taxes. So I converted it to dollars, that's $4 billion, and that remains unpaid. The, the government said they issued the letter in December, 
but that's been unpaid. So, and there's also pressure on revenue. So people are saying, why don't you just pay this? But I think that given what we see now, it might just happen that everything is in stoppel for six years uh, while uh, this government is in place. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and uh, we'll have a chance to get into questions uh, very soon because I know you have a lot of other things you want to cover. Um, next, uh, a person who needs really no introduction on this stage, uh, Jonathan Head, who's the BBC Southeast Asia correspondent, uh, was over in the Philippines covering uh, the election or was there before the election, and, and I'm sure he has some observations. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, so mine is going to be a perspective of what it was like as a, a journalist to watch this campaign um, with also the perspective of having covered many other campaigns and many other stories in the Philippines, indeed watching Duterte come to power in 2016. And there are some broad themes there that you will see in other countries as well. You know, much of what we saw in the Philippines is not that unique to the Philippines. Um, I, I think, I mean, for any journalist who was there, the most exciting campaigns to watch during this campaign, and Philippines campaigns are always exciting. They're very colorful, they put a lot into it. They don't have any of the restrictions we have here in Thailand in how you can entertain your, uh, in Thailand you're not even allowed to sing during it. I mean, if you couldn't sing in a Philippines election, people wouldn't come and vote. Every campaign's got singing, dancing, bands, razzmatazz. But the Lenny Robredo campaign was extraordinary for its energy. I mean, it was youthful, imaginative, very colorful, extremely passionate. And, you know, on paper, she was an amazing candidate. I mean, she's one of the very few candidates for top office in the Philippines, in my memory, who was absolutely clean. There's not a spot of corruption on her. She's got a compelling personal story. She lost her husband in a tragic air accident 10 years ago. She's got a lifetime of public service. You know, on paper, she was the perfect candidate. And yet she could not make a dent on the Marcos campaign. And it was absolutely fascinating to watch. At those Lenny Robredo campaigns, the sea of pink, pink was the color she chose to try and differentiate herself because the Duterte's had gone, had gone for green, Marcos had gone for red. She didn't want to be yellow because that was associated with the kind of discredited uh, sort of liberal administrations the Marcos and Duterte's had so successfully demonized. And there was very much a sort of rainbow effect. There were a lot of LGBTQ people there. Uh, very, it was a very liberal crowd. And you did kind of get the impression that for all of the passion, she was kind of preaching to her own choir. And when you move outside of the, the, the more comfortable parts of, of Manila and the Philippines, or indeed if you talk to many Filipinos working here or in other countries, overseas Filipinos, the support for Marcos was remarkably strong and very, very clear. And I think, you know, already um, Richard and Johanna have, have highlighted why that was so, so much the case. Yes, the Marcoses have been preparing for this ever since they were forced out of the Philippines in 1986. As, as Richard said, you know, Imelda very nearly won the election in 1992 when she ran for president. She could have won it. They've always held office. They've, you know, they've always held significant offices in the Senate, in the Congress, or particularly in their own uh, fiefdom of Ilocos Norte. And by allying with the Dutertes, this really was an extraordinary dynastic alliance. You've got to remember the Marcuses, you've got Ferdinand Marcus's power base up in the north. He married Imelda, her power base, her family, the Romueldas, has come from Leyte um, in the central part of the country. Then they allied with the Dutertes, who bring the whole of the south with them. It doesn't matter how the campaign went, whichever way you look at it, just that made this particular campaign of Marcos incredibly powerful coalition. Whatever they did, however well the campaign went, it would have been an extremely powerful bank of voters who were going to vote for them anyway. But their appeal went much further. And one of the, the strange things about it was Bonbon Marcos is not a charismatic candidate. He's not like his father. He's not that sharp, or at least doesn't come across that way. And he ran a, a campaign of being very cheer, cheerful, but extremely vague. He avoided any interviews. He literally refused almost all interviews apart from supportive, sympathetic media. He turned down all of the televised debates that all the other candidates went to, and yet it worked. And, you know, it fascinated me as to why it worked. Now, one of the reasons is that, you know, people in the Philippines now do feel very let down by what we call the post-EDSA period. So that's the period that followed the ousting of Ferdinand Marcos Sr. in 1986, with great hope that democracy would be restored, that the terrible corruption and abuses of the Marcos era would go. 
we're 36 years on from that now. It's a long time. Most of the people voting can't remember that time. You know, they, it's, so the, the Marcos years are actually quite in the distant past, whereas the years afterwards are now broadly and successfully portrayed by Marcos and Duterte and his ilk as a failure. It suits Marcos to do that, because, of course, these are the very people, this, this, this sort of liberal elite who threw out his father. And it works, because, after all, the performance for most Filipinos economically has not been good for the last 36 years. We saw with Duterte, who's a very dark, disturbing man, and put the fear of God into people, and, you know, he's got a you know, taste for death and blood. But he persuaded people that being that different was necessary, that their, their, their country had failed so badly they should actually put somebody as, as brutal and as controversial as him in. And what was so clever about the Marcos campaign was that Marcos portrayed himself as something very different from Duterte, very sunny disposition. He talked about unity, about being uh, welcoming everybody in, always smiling. Totally different, but with Sarah Duterte as his running mate, he was also preaching continuity. And you know, Rodrigo Duterte, for all of his, his controversial uh, positions and policies, ended his term more popular than any other Filipino president in recent history. So th that was an enormous asset for Marcos. But he did something else as well, and I think this is very important. Y look, there's been a huge amount of discussion about the disinformation campaigns, and they were intense. If you went on to YouTube, particularly, but it, you go on to Facebook too, and saw the kind of barrage of videos portraying the, the old Marcos era, the martial law era, as this golden age, when things got built, I mean, if you actually knew something about the building projects of the old Marcos era, they were really controversial, uh, and a lot of them just sort of useless showpieces that bankrupted the country. But th this, this messaging was extremely successful. And Marcos didn't just start it a year before the election. He started it after he lost the vice presidency five years, six years before, in 2016. So it's a very, he had a very long build-up, this barrage of, of uh, disinformation but it kind of worked because I think people were ready for something different. They were look ready, and it was, a, it was a, a story that worked for so many Filipinos because they, you know, if you ever look at any of the interviews with Imelda Marcos, this woman who was part of one of the most spectacular kleptocracies the world has ever seen, never mind the shoes, it was the money, it was the gold, it's the properties, it's the incredible art that she owns. She doesn't hide it. Imelda Marcos has always said, yes, I've got tons of money. Come and have a look. Look at this bank account. Look at this, you know, I've got gold here. And what the Marcoses did with this fantasy world that we're portraying on social media was tell poorer Filipinos, yeah, we've got tons of money offshore. They didn't say they stole it, of course. They said they came up with another story about how Marcos Sr. got it. We've got gold. We've got bank accounts. And if Bonbon bon Marcos wins, we're going to bring that back into the country. And time and again, when I went around poorer neighborhoods, people came up with these stories that if Bonbon bon bon gets in, we'll all get a piece of his money. They really believe this stuff. That has raised very significant questions about the role of social media, justified questions. There were serious problems with the way that social media was weaponized during the, 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 the campaign to get Duterte into power and the way that it was used after during his presidency. Um, as my good friend Maria Ressa has, has experienced, you know, she's been persecuted for trying to expose this incredible sort of manipulation of social media. And that was a big role in this, in this campaign. But I think for two reasons, we shouldn't focus on it too much. And one reason is the margin by which Marcos won was staggering. Even with the social media disinformation, the fact is I can't see any way that he wouldn't have swept the board. There were so many other reasons. I mean, he was flattered by his opponents. There was no one single anti-Marcos candidate. Lenny Robredo was not, a, not particularly charismatic, and she declared very, very late. There wasn't enough time for her supporters to build up momentum to challenge this incredible narrative. And she was also put in a position where she could either go and try and discredit Marcos, but he very successfully said, all these other politicians, they do negative campaigning. Lots of Filipinos I spoke to said, oh, we don't like the opponents of Marcos because they're negative. You know, because people kept saying, well, what about the human rights abuses? What about the um, corruption? I mean, those were justified things to raise, but they were 36, 40 years in the past. And remember, Filipinos have supported Duterte to the end. He slaughtered thousands of people in his drug wars. Do you think people are going to be impressed when international media go and interview somebody who was tortured or lost a, a son back in the 1970s? Well, of course it didn't resonate. resonate. So, you know, th th there were lots of reasons why Marcos had this tremendous momentum. Um, he was also very clever about 
using his father's record because Marcus himself, he talked a bit, but he didn't talk about his dad much. Mostly what he said was the sins of the father shouldn't be visited on the son. In other words, he's saying, I'm not like my father. I will be different. But his supporters rammed home this campaign. Actually, his dad was great, and he'll bring back the same, the same kind of uh, uh, successes they claimed. And it, you know, that double whammy, that social media messaging together with the Marcos campaigning on stage was very, very successful. But I don't think it can be policed. Facebook shut down 400 accounts. They were looking, they had teams in there looking for what they call coordinated misinformation. They make a dis distinction between disinformation and mis sorry, disinformation, what they're looking for rather than misinformation. But you know, the social media world now is massive, it's atomized. It's complete anarchy out there. You can't control it. The only way, um, and it's something I, I've suggested, because Maria Ress has really gone for Facebook, and she really, she's arguing that they should be responsible, they've got to be held accountable. But in fact, the only way you could really control Facebook is by shutting it down, because the entire business model of Facebook is, is based on massive engagement, intense engagement, and you get that through uh, incit incitement, often you know, making people feel frightened, whipping them up, making them feel angry. That's what works, that what get, that's what getting get, gets engagement. If you try and take that out of the equation, Facebook's business model falls apart. So either you abolish Facebook or you accept the fact, and this is something that's gonna be reality, not just to the Philippines, but in most countries, that we are going to be trying to manage democracies, not in a kind of uh, sort of battlefield of reasonable ideas, but in this sea of disinformation, this tide of disinformation, um, and it, it makes it very, very challenging for those who want to stay, you know, to, to re recognize the integrity of facts, of sort of balanced information, very hard. The other thing is that this massive breakup of the media, this, this complete sort of splintering of it into these you know, thousands of sources, means most people are pretty confused. You know, the, in, 20, 30 years ago, um, the only source of information was so limited that most people got more or less the same kind of view of, you know, with some marginal variations. One politician would say this, another would say that. But it was presented in a very well moderated way. Now when people look at any issue, they've got thousands of sources. It's very confusing. And quite naturally, most people tend to gravitate towards somewhere they feel comfortable and then stick to their teams, like for supporting a football team. They don't argue the issues anymore. They back their team. I think in Asia, the Philippines has probably got that more in a more extreme way than anywhere else. As a journalist myself, one of my experiences of Reporting and my colleagues have the same thing is that you try and report in a balanced way, but you get massive amounts of attack Really nasty death threats the whole works people get really fired up. You know, you're you're discrediting our, our candidate You're not being fair and that you know, that is a real world that we have to deal with and I don't think that Policing it or blaming social media would really make very much difference to the re result we saw um, the fact is that lots of people in the Philippines liked Marcos's message. However absurdly distorted it was, however vague it was on details, he managed to get across this idea, these simple notions, a bit of nostalgia, um, you know, hope for the future, a bit of, you know, I'm a, nice, I'm a nice guy, very, very polished kind of image that was presented, very few details. And it was, you know, there just wasn't a, an alternative there that could possibly have grabbed people's imaginations and so realistically you know shocked as the rest of the world is that a family who let's face it have never apologized for what Ferdinand Marcos senior did not the killings not the torture and not the theft on an absolutely outrageous you know they're unashamed they they flaunt their wealth um, but the fact is they they've done all that for years and Filipinos still voted them in by a record number of votes so in the end you know, everyone's got to accept this result try to learn less lessons from it, but as one uh, very astute observer in the Philippines said to me, he said, the worrying thing is that Marcos has done so well off this massive disinformation, this dishonesty. Every other candidate in future elections is going to look at this and think, well, we should do the same thing. And it you know, brought to mind, to me, to some way, in some ways, the experience, for example, my country in Britain had it with the Brexit debate it, back in 2016. You know, that vote was lost with a huge amount of disinformation, in particular on the pro-Brexit pro side. And there was outrage afterwards from by opponents of Brexit that it was all dishonest, it should never have happened, it's, it's stupid, it's ridiculous, it's self-harming. But the fact is people liked the message of the Brexiteers. And they didn't like being told by other people that 
it's all going to go get messed up, you're going to have a poorer country, you're wrong. They didn't like it and it didn't work. The people who opposed Brexit assumed that their economic arguments, their rational arguments would trump the emotional investment that people have put in the pro-Brexit side and they miscalculated terribly. And there was an element of that in this election. However ridiculous it seems, Marcos won people over. Whether he can deliver, of course, is a much bigger question. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, and now we're going to turn to uh, Tarindu uh, Abiretna. He's a program officer and mission coordinator for the AS ASEAN Asian Network for Free Elections, ANFRO, which is the election observation team. He was on the ground uh, for the month before the election and was coordinating various different international election observers. Uh, and he'll talk a little bit about the election and what it means. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. Um, yeah, I think like most of the, the speakers are already uh, portrayed like more broader idea about the election and what happened uh, before the elections like long time ago and then how this thing built up. Uh, I'll, I think mostly focus on the, the election uh, process uh, like as election observers. We observe the, uh, the, in the election the, the campaign process and in the election day process um, and uh, it was, uh, I have a small presentation I'll, I'll go through it uh, as well. Like it's, it's around like 65 million people voted on the election day. And uh, one thing that we also have noticed uh, after the election, the, the voter turnout. Uh, I saw uh, earlier in 2016, it was somewhere around 81% uh, voter turnout. But uh, this time it got like further up. Uh, somewhere around 83, 84. So that means like during the observation as well that we saw even in the early morning, like when uh, the polling station opened six in the morning, so many people are there in line to vote. And even the campaign period, it was very colorful and then a lot of people engagement. Um, and and then, then also uh, the one thing that we also have observed like somewhat different from the other Asian countries, uh, they have a lot of uh, the political party representatives in the polling stations, a lot. So that, that means like it was more uh, the, the people, but the participation in the elections was uh, uh, in big number. Uh, that was a good point. Um, and then the, I think like mostly, um, but we, I, will, I will have like two different uh, things to discuss, like the first one about the election day, because many people will be uh, thinking, you know, what happened in the election day. But as election observers, we mostly focus on the whole process. Like the election is not just the, what happened in the election day. It's all about the happen in the before the election and after the election as well. So let's get into the, the election day. So uh, just after the, the first day of the election, there were many news outside and then many rumors about the VCM issues because in, in, in Philippines, uh, we have the, they have the, the water counting machine that the, uh, in each polling station that the people will mark their ballot and then they bring it and then to the feed into the machine. And at and the end of the day, the, the count will be transmitted to the, uh, the Comlex servers. So that's how they, they, uh, they conduct the vote. So, but uh, there were many cases uh, reported uh, during the election day, the breakdown of the VCM machines. So it was around like final count came around like 1,800 uh, VCM machines were broke down. And then we also have seen the, some, in some polling stations like the, the, when the VCM machine or the SD card broke down, so the, some people had to wait around like 16 to 20 hours to, with their ballot paper to cast their vote. So that also can like happen like we assume some sort of uh, disfranchisement because the people will not vote, uh, wait for like 20 hours in the line to vote and they will just go home. But when it comes to the, uh, the numbers, like it's, a, it's somewhere around like 1.76, one, one some like, like a little bit, uh, somewhere around like 2% of the, the issues with the VCA. And, and then we go to the, the secrecy of the ballot. That is one of the uh, very, um, uh, the big issue that we observe as election observers in the, this election. Um, because in, in many countries, maybe you have seen in, 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 um, in the Asia or outside Asia, 
uh, the people have, they are using their, the bo polling booth to uh, cast their ballot. So it's, it's, a, it's a secrecy place that they, they can cast their vote freely. But in Philippines, if you see some, uh, maybe in the pictures, so they are not using the polling booth. So they are just using the, poll, uh, the secrecy uh, folder. So you have a very long ballot paper that, um, so they uh, the close the, with the secrecy folder and then vote. The thing is like the most of the time, like even when we were in the polling stations and then even from the outside sometimes, you can see who they are voting for because it's not fully covered area. And that can be also be uh, lead to some other issues like vote buying because uh, like there are so many people, so many uh, the party agents, uh, candidate agents are in the polling station inside that they can see who they are voting for. That, that is one of the, the, another big issue that we also have identified uh, during the election day. And then the third one uh, is the campaign during the election day. So the campaign was very vibrant. Uh, like, of course, uh, there are a lot of misinformation, disinformation uh, that we will, I'll, I'll go into that later. But uh, the, according to the, the election law, and then it's just not in Philippines, in the many other electoral systems also, like the election day and then day before the election, so you cannot really uh, campaign, but it's happening. But in Philippines, uh, it was um, in big numbers. Like even there were many instances that we observed there in front of the uh, polling station on the election day. So there are leaflets being uh, distributed. And then, then some of these uh, people uh, bring those leaflets like uh, sort of uh, sample ballot papers. And then they use that ballot, ballot papers to view during when they mark their uh, their ballot papers. So, and what law says that you cannot do any campaigning, you cannot have any posters or anything 30 me meters uh, or like from the polling stations, but even in front of the polling station that was happening. And then we also see like many instances that where they use the children to uh, distribute those ballots. Um, Apart from those main uh, the issues that we have seen on the election day, uh, there are other couple of things like uh, COVID-19 regulations was not really um, uh, really um, regulated during the campaign period, and then uh, and also during the uh, the polling day as well. So those are the, the main issues. But at the end of the day, uh, Anfil, as Anfil, we were able to uh, observe the election day process and then also the transmission of the, um, the, the results to their uh, COMLEX servers from the VCM machines. And then we believe that the process was uh, okay and then those transmission, like at the end of the day, the, the election day results reflect will of the people of, the, uh, of Philippines. So that's in nutshell. And then let me go to the, uh, the pre-election period, which is like the election day, like you can have a really perfect election day. I think that's, that's sort of a, not just in Philippines, but nowadays the most of the elections we you see, we observe in Asia or maybe outside Asia as well, like pretty much similar. The election day, you have a very peaceful election day, but what everything happens day before the elections. So especially during the campaign, uh, period. So we, uh, this, that's one of the things like during the campaign that we observed about the vote buying. Uh, vote buying was like very widespread. Uh, I would be, I would say like honestly, that is one of the, the biggest number of uh, vote buying cases that we have observed in, in Asia itself. So like many countries, when we go for election observation, and then we always try to find the cases and then the evidence of vote buying, and it is so hard to find it because it's always happening under the table. It's not very uh, outside. But uh, our observers were able to find uh, many cases like with the evidences. There are times that they, many times that you, you get an uh, envelope with the name of and the number of the uh, the candidates and then inside uh, you have money like it's it's starting from around like 200 pesos to around uh, 2000 pesos it's around 200 pesos like around four dollars and uh, like 20 dollars so like you you some there are ma many instances like you get not just from one candidate you get from many candidates 
and then the, we also have met one uh, one of the voter who was not really uh, her name was not in the the list she was very angry because her name was not in the list because she cannot get the money from the different candidates so it was in that level crazy uh, what we observed during the election it's not just like about one party or one candidate i think it's it's mostly uh, everyone it's very widespread as well and then the the second thing uh, also during the campaign that we observe of the use of state resources as well again same like the vote buying uh, that's also very open uh, there were instances that we observed some of the police officers the city police officers are campaigning for some of the mayors with their uh, their police uniform itself and uh, and also it's connected with like this political dynasty issues uh, it's always the mayor the current incumbent mayor always used their resources uh, for their campaigning and then nobody is uh, you know like opposing it and then it's it's sort of become i think have become part of the uh, the election culture itself um, also has to be uh, you know uh, controlled um, and then no more legal uh, revisions and and then the implementation limited and then the the other one is lack of uh, uh, level playing field of course like with a lot of money put in uh, to the uh, the campaign um, that 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 we also have observed uh, many instances where a lot of uh, the goods also being distributed during the campaign in, in starting from the food uh, the clothes um, and then some other things being distributed during the campaign uh, period uh, in the rallies uh, and also there are some candidates like especially either incumbent or these like political dynasties like put a lot of money uh, in into the campaign which cannot create really living field level play, playing field at the end of the day uh, and also there are some uh, campaign finance uh, regulations in the uh, in 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 uh, in Philippines which is not really updated uh, that you cannot really run a campaign with the money that you you know like the amount that is in the in the laws and the papers and also the implementation is uh, very very low so like uh, when it comes to the let's say the vote buying uh, there were maybe I, I can't remember really remember the number but very less number of uh, their their cases like somewhere around like couple of hundred cases only that uh, Comlec has been really investigate. Uh, we don't know what happened after that, also for those investigation. Um, and then there, the other uh, like campaign finance uh, regulation, those kind of things are not really uh, implemented well. Uh, that we recommend, I mean, in, in the future elections, uh, those things also should be uh, considered as well. And then the, I think Jonathan was like very, very, uh, thoroughly explained about how the the whole online campaigning and then the online space uh, worked during the, uh, the 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 elections. It was so toxic. I think it was. It's it's more about the state being responsible. I think like those uh, social media companies also have like a big responsibility to uh, play a very important role uh, in elections. So we we seen like this is not just in Philippines. But in the other parts of the, uh, the world as well, like these companies are not really paying attention. There are some elections that they pay more attention, but uh, we, we also have seen very lack of attention from the Facebook, Twitter. Uh, also like TikTok has played a very important role this time in the future elections. Uh, uh, the other thing like actually in, in the Philippines, the average uh, person is using social media or like scrolling down up and then social media than the average person in the world. Uh, I can't really remember the numbers, but it's, it's, it's much higher than the average. The world average is much less than the Philippine average itself. So the people are really focused on social media. They are in the social media itself. So then that can create a huge impact. Uh, and also talking about the media environment, we have seen like a couple of years ago, one of the biggest media company being shut down from the Duterte regime. Uh, so in that kind of environment have created, uh, the election being conducted in that kind of environment itself. And then the, I will, one more uh, thing I think needs to be added um, about the uh, dispute resolution. And then that was one of the co uh, controversial 
issue um, during the, uh, the, the whole election period we have seen, still it's been continuing about disqualification of uh, Bombom Marcos. Uh, so that as election observers of itself, like we think like the COMBLEC should have play a more, uh, uh, more proactive role when it comes to those issues because what we have seen like when the first complaint comes, it took so long for them to uh, take a decision. And then uh, what, what lo the law says, so the first you have to complain to the COMLEC and then the appeal to the COMLEC. The COMLEC have right to uh, investigate the appeal and then give the verdict and then you go for the, um, the Supreme Court. So the first one they got led and then the second appeal, the, uh, the results came just after the election day. So everybody know who won the election, like when the, the appeal results came out. And then uh, now it's in the Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, usually the whole Supreme Court process takes a couple of years. Let's say you assume um, uh, the, the Bombo Marcos got dis disqualified from the, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court but it's, it's already been like two or three years in the, in the line in his, his, his time. So it's very unlikely that can happen. Uh, and then that case also very weak um, in sense. So these other, uh, the things that like Comlex should have played more, um, we, we always encourage, you know, like it's just not about the Bombo Marcos case. Like there were many other disqualifications happen uh, last minute. So like there were instances, uh, because it's just on not only the, the, the national elections, it's also the local elections as well. So disqualification came late and then the persons were disqualified but their names are still in their ballot papers itself. So that has to be, has to, they have to have a quick response system and then more responsible in, in that case. And also finally, let me mention about the people's perception about the COMLEC itself. So we think that uh, like this current, uh, the, the COMLEC has less trust when you compare with the past uh, because uh, the couple of uh, the new appointees, uh, the appointed uh, like very, the f just couple of months before the elections itself by the, by the Duterte, uh, the president. So the, the presidents have the ability and then right to up make the appointment, that's what the, the system says, but as election observers, like, and then they are, we always encourage this, the, the appointment uh, should be, come from the independent, but uh, there are many, many, uh, all across Asia and in the world, there are the, the, the cases where, the, the, the instances like the president or the prime minister appointing the, uh, the election commission uh, but generally, our perception is like, with, with those issues, um, it was less trust, public perception uh, about the COMLEC, uh, more controversial than the previous. Uh, so those are the, the main uh, highlights and main observation from our side. So if you have any questions, maybe we can ask in the later. And thank you. Thank you very much. And I should add that um, Enfro's, uh interim statement which gives their interim report is actually at the front uh people can get it. it it was available as people came in you may not have seen it um also i understand you're going to come up with a final report about the elections yeah, in july yeah in early july so we will come up with the final report as well so we'll include uh all our uh the analysis and then the um this this is like very a uh, brief report, like just a couple of days after the election, mostly focusing on the election day, but like more comprehensive, uh, the report will come later in early July. Great, thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna open the floor for questions. Um, there is a mic in the back over here. Uh, for people in the club who wanna ask questions, please approach the mic, introduce yourself, uh, indicate your affiliation, if any, and, uh, ask a question and uh, direct it to uh, how many ever of the panelists you want to discuss it. So the, fl the floor is open. Thank you, Phil. <coughs> I'm Franz Sarmedi, a club member from Indonesia. Uh, two, qu uh, two qu quick question for Richard in Manila and Johanna here. For Richard, so one question is that beside uh, Philippines, uh, 80 million Facebook user and 40 million TikTok user, 
I'm interested to ask you about Cambridge Analytica. Because back in 2020, Rappler, um, Brittany Kaiser, former Cambridge Analytica, she said that there was a request back into 2014 already from the Marcos family to rebrand the family image. Yeah? So what is your take on this uh, historical refu revisionism? Yeah? And uh, second for Johanna, maybe how not to lose hope. Because last Wednesday on the Philippine um, Congress proclamation of uh, Bongbong and Sara, Imelda was saying, I have two presidents now. Yeah. So this is really about family business. So how not to lose hope? Because um, it's likely that we will have also Sara Duterte as president in 2028 or uh, even earlier. Thank you, maraming maraming salamat. Okay, okay so uh, first question is to Richard about Cambridge yeah. Analytica and changing the, uh, the Marcos folks asking for Cambridge Analytica to change the information about their, their, their family history back in 2014. <laughs> right, right. Uh, to our friend in Indonesia. I mean, I've been covering, I mean, they say if you only know one country, you know no country. So I always try to understand what's happening in the Philippines in comparison to similarly troubled friends, including Indonesia, in Turkey, in Brazil, India, among others. So I think that's always very important. And I like that Jonathan emphasized Many things people talk about, you know, many, many things in the Philippines are absolutely not unique at all. Entertainment during election, hello, have you seen Boris Johnson using that, you know, boxing gloves <laughs> when he was running for elections? Personality-based politics, forget about that. Look at Trump, right? Zero background in politics, becoming the president. So I think sometimes we have to avoid exoticizing the Philippines because there are many things in the Philippines that doesn't make it quite unique, but similarly troubled country. Now, this question is important. This whole Cambridge Analytica stuff is important. Again. I, if you notice in my presentation, I didn't emphasize it that much. I wanted to leave it to our friends and panelists to emphasize that. But this is where I really diverge from what I would call receive wisdom. Yes, this information has been a factor, but I think it has been exaggerated as a factor for a number of reasons. First of all, it's very easy for the opposition to say this is just this information. That way, forget about talking about their strategy, their communications, their narratives, lack of proper tactics, etc. I mean. You mean, as far as Lenny is concerned, you know, her campaign manager is an Aquino, right? And you're running in a zeitgeist whereby people are against the Liberal Party, etc. I, I don't think that helped her. She uses communication narratives that are so 2016, if not 1986. You cannot use that in 2022. Marcus up his game. I can go on and on and on. There was a lot of unnecessary fights with other candidates we did not mention. For instance, centrist candidates like Isco Moreno, who could have split the vote of Sara Duterte to make sure that all the Sara Duterte votes don't go to Marcos. He was a centrist candidate who could have been the Macron of the Philippines if he played his cards properly. Of course, he didn't. So my point is, some people are overemphasizing this information or Cambridge Analytica or whatever. By doing that, they're actually taking away culpability from the other side in terms of their communication, narrative, strategy, among others. I'm not sure if Lenny really had a chance to win, but a two to one ratio, I mean, 31 versus 15, I'm not sure it should have been that big. I think if the opposition had the grand rallies much earlier, I think if the opposition had urgency much earlier, they had biggest celebrities behind Lenny Robredo, Piolo Pascual, Vice Ganda, et cetera. These people came out only towards the end of the race. We had celebrities who endorsed Lenny on May 7, two days before the elections. Like, who cares about you by that time? In January, surveys show that up to 60, 50% of Bongbong supporters could change their mind. By March, April, that was down to 10% probably, right, or less. So that's one problem I have with this whole disinformation paradigm. It is a factor, but in social science, we'll call it intervening factor, intervening variable or secondary variable. The second thing you have to keep in mind is this. Yes, you can get all the Cambridge Analytica, Swiss Analytica, whatever you want to call it. But if you are in a situation whereby the, the public has been properly educated, critical thinking has been instilled into educational institutions. In the case of Marcus's, for heaven's sake, and this is where you see how Philippines is a dysfunctional democracy, and that's why many people, people have lost confidence in the system. You see, if the Philippines didn't have judicial impunity, the Marcuses would not have been allowed to run for office. Imelda Marcos is a convicted person. Uh, Bombo Marcos has his own cases, yet he was allowed to run for the highest positions, right? And why is that possible? Because of complete judicial impunity. Is that disinformation? No, that's, disin that's failure of judicial institution. 
But why is that relevant to this information? You talk to a lot of people and say, oh, aren't the Marcuses accused of ill-gotten wealth and all of that? They'll say, well, if they're accused of that, why they are not in jail, right? Of course, you want to explain it's judicial. Imp no, they don't see it that way. Average people, they'll look at it and say, see, maybe there's really nothing against them because if they were really criminals, as the opposition says, why are they scot free and they can run for the highest office? That's a very, you see, so disinformation works when you have institutional failure. Disinformation works, right, when there's a grain of truth. And you see, in fact, there was a study done. They asked people who support Marcos, and a lot of them, and this might sound familiar to you, they didn't take a lot of these claims. I mean, Jonathan is right. There are some people who might buy this whole Kalano gold, Yamashita gold, blah, blah, blah. But majority of people who supported Marcos, they said they don't believe it literally, but they appreciate it figuratively because they're just so sick and tired of dysfunctional democracy, unfulfilled promises, dynasties getting worse, the economy is non-exclusive. They just want something radically different. So in 2016, they got Duterte. Didn't turn out perfectly well, but at least the guy tried his best. But let's go now to the more authentic one. Let's go to the originals, which are the Marcoses, right? So you have to understand this is the thinking of a lot of people. So if we reduce it to just saying, oh, we, we hired some guys, some British guys, and then they came here and manipulated people. By the way, there are no studies to suggest that Cambridge Analytica actually was decisive in the elections in the US. If they didn't have that, uh, electoral college, whatever, shenanigans, mm. Trump would end up being the president. So this is my problem. Like, yes, we have a disinformation problem, but it's nested in a, co in a context of massive institutional failure. And I'm very glad that some, one of our panelists talked about massive vote buying, talked about massive shortcomings of the commission elections, massive distrust of people to, towards the guardrails of democracy. That is not disinformation. That is institutional failure. That is the problem, because the problem of the Philippines is this. The moment the Marcoses were out, we got back to the usual business, right? Which is the dysfunctional democracy we had from 1946 to 1971. The same old oligarchies, the same kind of exclusionary economics, the same kind of weak state institutions. So people slept on their job. And that's why it said the victory of Duterte and back to back with Marcos, the chickens are coming home to roost because people did not do their assignment. The 1997 Constitution did not get into the bottom, into the root of the problem. It didn't even bother to have anti-defection laws so that we have real political parties. If we have real political parties, people didn't have to vote for celebrities and political dynasties right and left. But because political parties are a joke in the country, you can easily shift from party to the other overnight, then why would people even believe in political parties, right? The Philippines has an anti-dynasty law, but it's just generic. There's no enabling law. And they ask the Congress dominated by dynasties to pass a law against itself. I mean, who are these geniuses who came up with this 1987 constitution and expecting it will prevent another Marcus 30 years down the road. So we are paying the price for the rotten core of the half-baked, you know, reformist regime that we tried to establish. God bless the Aquinos. They did their best, but the best was not enough in this case, at least for a lot of people. And that's why this information worked. This information doesn't work in a vacuum. It works in a context of massive institutional failure. Thank you. Uh, and the question for Joanna? Uh, hope, I think it was. Yes. Well, I hope. mean, I think from what I hear and what I see and how I hear other people talk about it is that I think uh, people are trying to figure out what do we do with all the energy, for example, from the Roberto campaign. And... Um, Maybe in a way it kind of shows that uh, people kind of realize that there was this side of them still. It it seems like that the people who were with the Robredo side or at the end sort of went out campaigning for her were more of the people who kind of go out on the streets kind of thing. I think a lot of the supporters of, of Marco seem to be online people or are active online mainly. That's their world. So we have to see where the energy gets uh, directed into. She's, I think, wants to, has announced setting up another NG, an, an NGO kind of thing. Um, but I think that uh, if you look at like the last, uh, how many, six years, even under Duterte, there wasn't much uh, protests of the sort that we saw before. And I think that this is one of the questions that some of us were asking, like, we're all the angry people. So, um, and again, when I was reading Anna Politkovaya's book about Putin, it struck me that some of her questions 
like kind of s resonated with me. And one of her questions was, why were the people quiet? And how do we produce somebody like this, right? And she was like, so I think that's the kind that, I know you asked me about hope, but that's kind of my, my worry too. Um, but I think we need to realize that probably there was something here too in that aspect. And I think people hopefully will direct it towards something that maybe demands accountability from this government somehow uh, and help push them, pressure them in a healthy way, if you want to say, to put together a team that is competent and uh, can address some of the real problems. Where some of the questions have been around uh, what, uh, for example, Marcos himself, he didn't really manage anything. He, I mean, it's not like we know that this guy is a professional at this. It's not that kind of a background. So the next best thing is to hopefully put together a team that is uh, credible in that way. Last point, I want to diverge a bit because you mentioned the thing about number of hours online. And I have the figures. So Filipinos are spend the longest time online every day. That's 10.23 hours and then they spend four hours on social media. That's number two in the world. The other thing that's interesting to me is average number of social media platforms used each month, 8.4. FB ad reach, 103.3%. So if you use these channels, you do reach a lot of people. And social media, I think these spaces, they amplify whatever you throw in, right? You throw in junk, it multiplies. You throw in something nice, it multiplies as well. But I think that uh, uh, maybe now that the technology, if you call it, it's been like how many years now after social media, maybe we're now trying to get a better idea of not just its impact, but hopefully some way of um, I'm dealing with it. Um, just the last word about elections, I think about hope, is that maybe there's also space, hopefully, like if you look at places like Chile, maybe the, where they still use elections to bring in like something completely, completely new. And so given a country that has some parallels in that uh, having a um, dictatorship in the 70s, US backed as well, maybe that gives, for me at least, gives me a little hope, yeah. Would you like uh, to? Sorry, I, I know, can I, can I go yes, again? Because I think I was a little bit too negative. Let's go ahead. Kind of positive yeah. go on the hope issue. Let me give you some interesting numbers. First of all, actually, Len increased her numbers from 2016 to 2022, right? Uh, so in 2016, she ran for the vice presidency. She just got around 14 million votes. She went up to close to 15 million votes when she ran for the presidency. Why is that important? The last time a vice president ran for the presidency, this is Binai. He went from around 10 million votes to like 3 million votes, right? There was like a factor of three reduction. And when Binai ran for the Senate this year, he lost. So what does it mean? I think Lenny still has a future. Lenny can still run for the Senate. She can still run for the higher office. You know, Marcos, Bombo Marcos, by the way, lost for the Senate and vice presidency in the past, and yet he became the president. So apparently the presidency could go to people who have even lost in the races before. That for me says something about the political future of Lenny. If she wants to come back and she can come back stronger. The second thing, the, the pink movement. We didn't talk about it a lot. This is the number, especially the volunteers, the youth who came out going door to door across the country, legions of them. This is a very new phenomenon. A lot of them are Gen Z, younger generation, but this cuts across socioeconomic classes. Even some celebrities were involved. Guess what? That movement was just launched last October. It's a toddler. It's still in its youth and infancy, and we haven't seen anything like this for the past 30 decades. I don't know, maybe other historians can point out to me something different. But for me, this is something very hopeful. I think if Lenny, if other leaders, by the way, in the opposition, some still made it, so, for instance, Riza Pontiveros, a very progressive candidate, made it to the Senate, right? This kind of figures, I think together they can work, they can nurture, they can push this movement. And if this movement crystallizes, they may be quite effective in constraining the worst instincts of the Duterte Marcos axis, but also create a new movement, new party, and move forward. The Americans had their progressive era movement. Maybe the Philippines can fi finally have one of its own. We should stop just relying on elite families to fix the problem. Maybe it's time for us, the middle class, ordinary Filipinos, to make our movement. Therefore, I think we have some good indications here. Now I, now I sound more positive, so I think I balanced myself out. Thank you. I, actually, I, I, I wanted to, rather unorthodox, but I wanted to ask Richard a question, which was, what, 
the opposition to Marcos and Duterte involves some of the most powerful families in the Philippines, the so-called oligarchs, whatever you like to call them. These people are rich, powerful, and have got their way in the past. Why did they fail to come up with a candidate strong enough and credible enough early enough to challenge Marcos? It seems extraordinary that such powerful families could not agree on somebody who would have been a credible candidate. Well, uh, you're talking about this Marcos, right? Yeah, this Marcos, uh, the old one. Well, um, first of all, um, you know, the oligarchs in the Philippines, they play safe. So it's not a matter of supporting one candidate or the other. I know the operation is like, we give 40% to this one, 30% to this one, 20% to this one, depending on who is more winnable. So they want to be with the winner because they have to protect their interests. Number two, actually the oligarchs, let's just put it that way, they have been played against each other. So some of the oligarchs actually want to be on the good side of what they believe is the inevitable new regime. Uh, we're not going to name names, but for instance, Duterte has gone against what they call yellow oligarchs, the liberals, you know, supposedly the Ayalas, uh, you know, and many, uh, MVP, etc. Uh, then you have other oligarchs actually who benefited from that, you know. So, so the game, so they're not a monolithic group. Uh, at the same time, they're also not going to bet on one side. And in this election, some of the good oligarchs, if I can put it that way, they supported not only Lenny. I think a lot of them actually supported also Isco Moreno. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but I've been in conversation with some friends, right? And they were wondering, like, do you think Isco Moreno has a future and all of that? I said. Maybe in the Philippines, we might need a Macron in the future, right? Maybe not too liberal, but at the same time, competent, pro-human rights, etc. So I noticed that kind of argument still appeals to some of the better rich people, etc. But, but as I said, we cannot just rely on big families, the Aquinos, etc., or the uh, good oligarchs, etc., to help us. I think there has to be a movement. And, and one thing, Jonathan, I don't know, maybe you have noticed it throughout the years. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not old enough to, I'm not saying you're old, but I mean, but you know, I, I spend a lot of time abroad also among others. I mean, the thing is, the Philippine middle class is expanding. You know, the Philippine may not have grown as fast as it should have, but the Philippine middle class, if you put the C and upper D plus A and B, you're looking at the population as big as that of Australia's or almost Malaysia. So, so 15, 20 million Filipinos are legitimately middle class, right? So now you can build the kind of a movement that you cannot, you could not do 30, 40, 20 years ago when the middle class was super small. The problem though we have right now is the middle class is so sick and tired of dysfunctional democracy. They're flirting now with illiberalism or worse, but I don't think that's given, right? As I showed you, there's a lot of ambivalence and ideological agnosticism. So I think with a new generation of charismatic leader, new narrative and more viability and some support from good oligarchs, if you can put it that way, I think we can move in a good direction. I mean, Americans had the Carnegie's and Rockefeller later on doing good things for their country, right? So maybe we can have something like that. And we have people, we didn't talk about Vico Soto, for instance, this young, youthful mayor. Uh, you know, he comes from a celebrity background. One of his uncles, you know, was a senator who ran for the vice presidency, but he's a good guy. I mean, they, they have no blood leash, right? And I think these are people who could point out the future. So speaking of hope, actually, despite all the critics I've made, that's precisely what I'm saying. The old way of fighting for democracy just doesn't work anymore. It's time to be innovative, look for new figures. And maybe in the case of Lenny, if she ups her game, right, doesn't just go standard reformist liberalism, gets a better team, better strategy and narrative, I think there's still a lot that we can do in the coming years, as much as I'm worried about some of the things that could almost happen inevitably. Yeah. Great. Uh, question from the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gus Gustafsson. I'm not affiliated with anything. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, we talked a lot, or you have talked a lot tonight about uh, Marcus. I haven't heard very much about uh, the runner-up. And um, I was uh, not a, f uh, a very favor of Marcus. I actually been under Ferdinand Marcus under many years in Philippines. And my question is, uh, yes, Marcus win, he win very well. And uh, why do we not talk about why the opposition did it very bad? Because that's what happened. It, it's a clear win and uh, we have to accept it. And th this is not a surprise. I mean, it's been coming for many years. We know that Marcus is gonna come back. And the second question I have is about uh, vote buying. I mean, uh, we know very well how vote buying w goes on in the Philippines, and I'm surprised that you don't seem to know how, how the system works. And you say 2,000 pesos. It's not 2,000 pesos. This election was more than 2,000 pesos. 
I'm sorry to say, and the way it do, does, it's a more sophisticated system than you mentioned. So how do we do about the wood buying in the future? Okay. I, I just say, first of all, I think, I think we did cover why the opposition did badly. I hope we did. Maybe we didn't get it across clearly enough. I think both Richard and I certainly and, and Johanna have mentioned the reasons why the opposition did badly this time, and there's a whole load of lists, but actually also why Marcos did well. You know, it, it's a confluence of factors. Um, you know, the, it was a, Marcos was flattered by not being facing one single opponent and by having a main rival who came in very late when he'd already established the momentum of his campaign. Uh, but as Richard has said, there are many other factors as well. You know, people are, um, are sick of the way things have been, and Marcos presented himself very successfully, both as somebody capable of bringing back the so-called glory days of the past and a continuity candidate by being in partnership with the Duterte. Um, in, uh, my view was it was it would have taken a pretty extraordinary opposition candidate to be able to challenge the weight of the Marcos Duterte um, alliance. But um, I guess I don't know. Richard would probably agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think also maybe we can see that. Uh, uh, I think also we can see that uh, the election this year was maybe more mature than before because we see that uh, Pacquiao didn't only get 4%. Sorry, what, what was the last point? Uh, my point is that uh, I think we see the election also getting more mature in Philippines. If you s More mature? Mm. Yes, in the yeah. sense that uh, Pacquiao only get 4%. Pacquiao. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. I, I, A lot of people have asked me that question. Richard, wh why, did Mani, why is Manny Pacquiao kind of... Why did you so badly? You. Yeah, I mean, he, you thought he was going to be the celebrity. No, celebrity I think candidate. Pacquiao did better than expected. I mean, we were thinking he's like number four and five. He's number three. I think that's that. Yeah. That was quite surprising. You know, actually, let me be honest. Let me put it this way: one big reason, aside from Sarah, that Marcos got close to sixty percent, fifty-eight percent, based on the ninety-eight percent on official tally. You know. This is anecdotal evidence, but this is also backed up. It's, the problem is we have no exit polls, right? So this is one of the anomalies with these elections. We don't have exit polls. Talk to the survey guys. I don't want to get into that business. It's controversial. Uh, but going back to this, you know, a lot of people have said, a lot of people who voted for Marcos are not necessarily there for Marcos. They just didn't want the opposition to come back, right? You can say disinformation was a factor, but I would say just people are sick and tired. Right? So a lot of supporters of Isco Moreno also defected to Marcos. Isco Moreno was 14 to 15 percent last year. Now he barely got what three percent. He completely melted away, right? So Marcos picked up another 10 points there. He got another 25, 30 points from Sara. So in that environment, obviously Pacquiao was not seen as an alternative to the liberals. In fact, Pacquiao. I'm not sure I would agree that not Pacquiao getting third is necessarily you know, a sign of maturity. I mean, uh, Pacquiao bothered to attend debates in fairness to the guy. And I think he did pretty okay in the debates. Marcus Jr., he didn't attend any of the commission election debates or any of the debates hosted by, let's call it legitimate mainstream media, right? So I'm not sure how we're gonna assess maturity and all. And I would say Pacquiao in fairness had his heart in the right place and his number three was not too bad in, in fairness. So the story also here is the center melted away. Sarah's numbers went to Marcos and then Marcos had that 15, 20% that he always had, which he had in 2016. And so the loyalist base, right? So when you put that together, it makes sense why it became 60%. So what does it mean? The strategy of the opposition should have been make alliances with the center and potentially even running under a centrist platform, center left platform. We have seen that working in Czechoslovakia, they tried a uh, Czech Republic, sorry. They tried to do that in Hungary. And let's not forget in the case of Chile and Peru, the only reason the, uh, you know, the remnants or supporters of the old regime didn't win is because they have run off election, which is another weird thing in the Philippines we have no run of elections. Why does that matter? Yes, Marcos got majority this time, okay. But the problem is that when you don't have run of elections, you have no culture of coalition building. Because in a non run of elections, all you need to do is get more votes than the others. So you are encouraged to be maximalist, as crazy, sensationalist, echo chamberish as possible. That culture did not go away. I think if certain groups we're better at coalition building. There was, there was a really united opposition. It was really one-on-one. -on -one. Who knows? Maybe the fight could have been much closer. I think Marcos would have still won it if, because Sarah withdrew. But who knows? Things could have still happened there. But 
the Philippines doesn't have a culture of coalition building. I mean, there was a lot of shooting in their own foot by centrist candidates, opposition between centrist candidates. So Marcos just had the last laugh. Yeah. Hmm. More questions from the floor? Yeah, thanks. I'm Pierre Prakash from International Crisis Group. I have a question to whoever's up for it. Um, on the topic that actually, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't touched upon tonight, which is the situation in Muslim Mindanao, in the Bangsamoro, where, I mean, I think it's pretty safe to assume that internationally, at least, uh, you know, Duterte presidency will be largely associated with the war on drugs. But on the brighter side, he did, you know, oversee um, the adoption of the Bangsamoro, Bangsamoro Organic Law, which led to the creation of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, uh, which, you know, essentially put an end to decades of conflict in that region and is arguably uh, today one of the most successful pro peace processes in the world at this point, um, so far at least. So my question is, what can we expect from Marcos on this peace process? Is he going to be behind the peace process? Is he, I think when he was a parliamentarian, he has sometimes hinted that he was not too much in favor of having ex-rebels running part of the country. Can we you know, count on him to be um, pushing that peace process till the end, which has now been postponed till 2025 when you're supposed to have elections there? Uh, any indications on what his approach to that peace process will be? Thank you. Yeah. Let's go to Richard. That, that's a very good question. I, there's also a question online that's in the similar vein from uh, Lee Yu Kyung, uh, who's a, a Korean journalist here in town, who again basically said, um, uh, what could be the implication of having a Marcus Jr. Sarah Duterte administration for the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region where the remnants of I Islamic militants are not quite defunct? Would that transition process in that region go smooth or in turmoil under the Marcos Duterte in power? So. Over to you, Richard. <laughs> I'm oh, going to okay. duck All out right. of that one. All right. I thought I, I'm, I'm talking too much, so I'm just being polite. Um, no, I'm kidding. Well, I mean, I'm sure other panelists have a lot to say on this, but uh, you know, I've been to Marawi. I've been covering the Mindanao issue for quite some time. You know, um, yes, it's true. In fairness to President Duterte, because he comes from Mindanao, he understands this issue. In fact, when he ran for presidency, he, uh, mm, he said he's the first Moro president. I mean, he told that to more people. And in fairness to him, he expended a lot of political capital on the peace process. For me, this was his finest hour because if you look at the other candidates in 2016, including those supported by former President Aquino, God bless his soul. A lot of them were wishy-washy on whether they want to push all the way with this Bangsamoro. Duterte, no. That was conviction politics for him. He went all the way. Now, the reconstruction of Marawi, my goodness, it's, it's a horror. Not, no good job at all. Implementation, etc. There are lots of problems. But in terms of the macro-political capital allotment, yes, Duterte did a very good job, I think. And, and, and a lot of people in Mindanao are very thankful to him. That's why he could have been a factor if in these elections he actually endorsed someone else early on. But he didn't endorse anyone, so therefore it became a non-factor at some point, and daughter carried the day. Now, on Marcos, uh, you see, actually, the uh, Moro Islamic Liberation Front uh, leadership, Hajj Murad, endorsed Lenny. And I, I believe that was a very brave move because it was risky, considering how all the surveys were saying it's going to be a runaway win for Marcos. So that was also an act of conviction by them. Now, whether that's going to alienate Marcos or not, I don't know. And I think as far as Marcos is concerned, he cannot do what his dad did, which is provoke a war there. Nor can he deny the Mindanao issue because Sara Duterte and other Mindanao blocs are going to be influential in the coming government. So I think they'll make sure that no necessary war happens there. Nonetheless, one thing I want to watch out is who will be the national security advisor. I'm not sure that has been designated and the defense secretary because the military establishment will be very crucial in how the government approaches these domestic national security issues we saw for instance in the on the communism issue that peace negotiations with the uh, cpp npa the communists in the philippines the back uh, the the pushback sorry by the defense establishment was a big factor that eventually fell apart duterte wanted to go more all in on that just the way he went on the barm issue but there was a pushback. So I think it matters. Uh, like, I think his choices for defense minister, not to Sara, let's see who's he go going to give it, and the national security advisor, that might tell us something about where he wants to go. The other thing is this, uh, I think we didn't discuss foreign policy at all 
And I think this is where we actually could have good surprises under Marcos. Again, I'm waiting out who will be the next foreign secretary. But my sense is Marcos will be much more balanced, much more statesmanlike. Unlike Duterte, he has nothing against the West personally. Uh, of course, there are the court cases in the U.S., but Modi got away with a lot. So, you know, his visa restrictions because of the Gujarat issue and all was removed. I'm sure Marcos can work around that because now he's the head of state and has sovereign immunity. You see, Marcos's are a product of the West, culturally, educationally. I don't know if he ever graduated of anything, but their cultural education from the West. So I think they would want to also get some international affirmation and support from our friends in EU, from our friends in the US, Japan, etc., who also support the peace process very strongly. So recently, Marcos had a meeting with the Japanese ambassador, American uh, consul, among others, uh, our European friends just today, a British ambassador also had a meeting. You see, all of these partners want Marcos to continue what Duterte started. So I don't think he wants to um, trigger a war, but my worry is that he might not put the right persons in charge of the national security, et cetera, people maybe who are a bit hawkish. Uh, that's one thing I'm going to watch. I'm not saying he's going to do that. But the second thing is this. If there's one thing we learned from the ARMM, Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao Experience, which was a failure, that's why we're now pushing for something different, bigger, et cetera, bar, is that you need national government to give sustained fiscal, institutional, and political support, if not more, right? And we need an international community to help. Because former rebels are not necessarily the best governors, right? We saw that with Nur Miswari in the past, right? So in this case, Marcos in the next six years will have to come up with a strategy to enable bureaucratic capacity building under the barn. And the good thing with the MILF folks, at least some of the folks that are going to run the show, is that a lot of them are getting master's degree, are getting advanced training, and also I think they learned their lesson. So I would... So my point is that I'm cautiously optimistic. It's not going to be as bad as a lot of these critics think. But whether it's going to be good enough to get this one right the way we could not get the ARMM, I think the jury is still out. It's too early for me to say, to be honest. But us, on the outside, whatever capacity you are, we have to encourage the best instincts or the better angels of this incoming administration. I think we have to be ethically realistic in engaging with this administration while also checking its worst instincts. I think Rich has actually highlighted one thing, which is because Marcos gave very few details. He actually had a, a manifesto, but he didn't talk about it much on stage, and he refused to be interviewed and refused to attend mm. debates. He le he's left himself very much as a kind of blank sheet. Um, yeah. No one's quite sure what he believes on a lot of issues, although his comments on the, um, the South China Sea dispute early on certainly mark him out as being different from Duterte. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I was going to say Joh Johanny because maybe you have some yeah, views on it. What's his pers I mean, personally, how capable is he going to be as a president? I mean, he's considered as a bit of a spoiled mama's boy, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, and there was this discussion of uh, like notes from the older Marcos about his kids, and they said that this guy, he said that Bongbong Bong is lazy. That's what he put in his diaries. <laughs> but the thing is, no, I was just about, uh, it just brought to mind discussions with other journalists, and there's actually a real. Mm, what shall I say, fatigue in a sense with the Duterte government in the sense that, you know, this was a guy who like, he likes to speak at midnight, like 11, 11.30 and people like, I, I actually tried watching it a few times, I couldn't last long and he rambles, right? And then so he comes two hours late, three hours late, he skips the summits, he sends somebody else, like he sent the foreign secretary to the US recently but also, he, sometimes he goes to, the last time he went to Latin America for APEC and he didn't want to go, or he said he was sick, and then he changed his story, and whatever else. Anyway, what I'm saying is that, so he's not that presidential, if you say that. And so there's a, there's a real sentiment also that, can we have somebody real that probably would like not uh, swear <laughs> and you know be nicer, more presentable, they say. So there's also you know that, that, that part of it, I think. I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, like I said, maybe people are hoping for the least harm that's possible. And we can't, like, start, nobody's all knowing. So you can't, and you can't really say no what he's thinking inside, right? But I think everybody's definitely watching. Yeah. You can't really imagine Bongbo Marcos calling Pres President Biden the son of a whore, can you? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, the bar is too low, so that's a good thing for Marcos. No. The bar is too low on so many fronts, so he's going to look like improvement. Yeah, please. Peter Trainer, I'm a club member. Uh, just to follow on from the, the last question, Richard did, has said that since 1946, you've had a dysfunctional 
democracy. That's a long time. You pointed out the majority of the population are class D and class E. They are poor people. They know the poor, poor people and they've been poor people for a long time. So regardless of social media, marketing, promotion from politicians and all the rest of it, what everybody has promised to do, the poor people know it hasn't been done. I, I, I don't know many Filipinos in, in Bangkok, but I, I spoke to one last week who's a Marcus supporter, and I said, why? And she said, no, I'm from one of the poorest provinces in the Philippines, and no government has done anything for us. So we can give him a try, and if he's no good, we'll get somebody else after six years, implying that he won't be any good, but he looks good for now, and they don't expect to, to not be poor. Her family's been poor all the time, and they don't expect that to change. So the question is, is there any way at all that anything can develop, either through NGOs or... Um, strong personalities or one of the good families or a political party foreman who can actually present policies to the Filipino people on education, infrastructure, health, international development. Is there any way that someone with real structural changes can come forward and convince the, the Filipino people that the country can change, maybe follow the model of not Singapore, but maybe South Korea or Taiwan, and develop just into a normal society rather than a poor society. Is is there any way that can happen? We need another couple of hours for that one, but <laughs> it's a yeah. big question. Um, Who wants to take that one on? I, I'm going to just quickly throw in a, a, a comment on that. I mean, you know, it's it's a question you could ask about many countries. Uh, I. You know, the whole of Southeast Asia has similarities. I mean, some of what Richard's been talking about, you know, the frustrations of the middle class, but, you know, the Gen Z kind of desire to now to get mobilized. And you, you could, there's an element of that in Thailand. I mean, you look about the arrival of Move Forward, Future Forward, um, the middle class is sticking it, you know, to the conservative Lampratcha before that, maybe swinging now. Um, Indonesia's more fragmented. But if there's one thing, if you look at South, let's, go, let's not go bigger than Southeast Asia. We could, but let's stick to Southeast Asia. Let's leave out Singapore. Singapore is not even a country. Oh, it is a country, but it's more of a project or a concept. It's, it's very small. It's a city-state. Let's leave out Brunei. But look at the bigger countries. There's one thing they all have in common, is that there is no functioning judicial system in any of them that really works. Therefore, there's no accountability. Powerful people in mm. these countries cannot be held to account. And therefore, the pot, you know, I mean, politicians in Britain are, frankly, you know, pushing the boundaries of legality. Um, there is a system that's more or less trying to hold them to account. Same with Trump. Trump was an outrage in so many ways, but the system held just and held him. But it's not possible. And so I, I, my view is you can't have uh, the kind of healthy, responsible politics that you're looking for, and I'm sure many Filipinos and Thais are looking for, as long as you don't have institutions strong enough to hold power to account. The rest of the panel. Yeah. Others want to comment on that? Uh, just, um, just adding with that, like one of the gentlemen asked about their, the question about what can be done with the vote buying. Yes, and then I please. agree with him. Um, like the, the whole the institutional system is not well functioning. And then like there, there's no room to address these issues as well. So it's, it's not just like the election process itself. So it's the whole system itself, like the as Richard also said, like the whole democratic system is not working, and then that's black cash with the, the vote buying. Uh, we, we see, as I already earlier mentioned, the, the, the COMLEC itself. They don't have the, the institutional capacity to handle these cases, like same as the other institutions. And let's not look at the Thai Election Commission, which is a complete yeah. farce. You yeah. Know, just a thought. I, w I was thinking that th I think uh, in many ways the discussion is larger than just this election or just Marcos or the restoration of a Marcos. I mean, it does go back to our own habits in our own systems. And I think on that score, we really need to look inside and not like look for or always kind of like who is, who is at fault 
No, in many ways, it's a reflection of, I think, how the system has become. And, and I think there's a sense of worry also about um, whether what we thought was a consensus of sorts, regardless of political leanings, after 86 is fraying or has frayed already, past tense. There are a lot of analysts who say that that period is finished. It's more than I frayed. Mean, I mean, it's threadbare, isn't it? It's falling yeah, apart. Yeah, but I mean, part of the, the Lenny uh, support, I think, is a reflection of that. But maybe it can met metamorphose into something, too. And maybe she sees it because she, on purpose, didn't use yellow, right? Which was uh, has been associated with the previous Aquino uh, Jr. Uh, Binigno Aquino yeah, so I think there's a recognition of that, but I think where that can go is the other like unanswered question, which we will have to see. I think I mean I don't think this is the end of it, right? This is one chapter, and hopefully, in another six years, is a brighter story. Maybe I like to say that. Yeah. All, right. All right, I'm going to ask the last question. <laughs> Moderator's privilege. Uh, I'm Phil Robertson. Deputy Asia Director with Human Rights Watch. <laughs> no one's talked about human rights here and what we're going to see next. Um, you know, the, the, the commissioner and all the, com all the, the chair and all the commissioners of the Commission on the Human Rights in the Philippines have all now left office just, just, be just before the election, I believe. And so now uh, Marcos is going to be able to appoint an entire new commission. Um, there is a international criminal court investigation uh, ongoing from the prosecutor of that court uh, into whether crimes against humanity were committed in the Philippines connected to the drug war. Uh, what is Marcos going to do on human rights? And what is he going to do about those, those uh, commission appointments? Is he going to try to uh, essentially white wa create a bunch of cronies in there that are then going to basically diminish that commission in a significant way? Yeah, can, I, can I, I go I, on I this? I was going to just add to, for Richard, because I think, Richard, you can probably answer this better. Um, yeah, actually, how much is Marcos committed yeah. to defending Duterte? And I suppose a lot depends on their relationship, too, because that's well, where that comes in, doesn't it? Right. I mean, first of all, just quickly on the Game of Thrones part, that's going to be the leash, right? <laughs> if the Duterte threatened the Marcos and said, oh, maybe I think we need ICC to help us with the investigations, our judicial institutions. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is real politics. So that's, that's where Marcos is going to play it smart, right? Um, speaking of the human rights situation, again, I think the reason we didn't talk about it is that we just said, you know what's going to happen, right? But actually, if you look at it, I'm not going to say everything's going to be fine and all, but, you know, Marcos can gain a lot of goodwill if he distances himself from some of the worst aspects of Duterte's policy. Number one, extrajudicial killings. So if you look at the um, Marcos, interviews during the campaign. In fairness, he had thorough one-on-one -on -one interviews, including with some friends of ours, Tito Boyabunda, for instance, whereby he said, I agree that we need the drug war, but it has to be more focused on rehabilitation. It has to be more focused on a surgical approach, meaning you don't go right and left against low-value low target, you go after high-value target. For me, he didn't have to say that politically. I mean, I, think, I don't think that even helped him politically because his base, a lot of that was pro-Duterte. And yet he said that. So maybe he actually quite means it, and he understands that things cannot continue the way they have been. And as Amy Marcos, the sister, said the other day, she's like the unofficial spokesman, is like, we don't want to waste a second chance, right? She didn't admit that they did something wrong, but she said, we get it. We have a second chance. We don't want to miss this one. Uh, so we are grateful about that. Uh, the other thing is on Senator Leila de Lima. Um, there are some indications that, at least in coming Department of Justice Secretary, not necessarily the paragon of liberalism, uh, but so someone that who might be quite different, less invested in going after Leila de Lima than the Duterte administration. So uh, Boeing Remunilia, uh, good lawyer and as a congressman, uh, not necessarily, again, your most liberal guy in the room. He said that the fact that a lot of witnesses against Leila de Lima have recanted their case, that's, use it, it, it that's an alarm bell, right? A red light, something like that. So that means something has to be done about it. And then there's the ABS-CBN franchise, which again can be reactivated. And I, I'm, I kind of know there are conversations going on there. So what I'm saying is that there are kind of low hanging fruits whereby Marcos can actually move in the right direction and make a very good impact. And at the same time, not fully vindicate his family, but at least 
extend the olive branch with the international community and opposition. And that's my advice to the opposition is, go and nudge Marcos in the right direction and tell him, you are not supposed to be bound by the worst instincts of Duterte, his worst policies. And as I said, thank you, Jonathan, for mentioning that, the ICC is going to be always the leash of Marcos. If he sees some trouble, he's going to say, okay, maybe you want to come in and investigate some of our friends here, right? So I think this is going to be the dynamics we're going to see. But nonetheless, on Commission on Human Rights, of course, I'm not from there, but I got to interview and meet a lot of friends, including the late uh, Chito uh, Gascon, who was in charge. You know, one thing they were telling me is that as bad as things are, in fairness, the budget for Commission on Human Rights has increased in recent years. A lot of folks who were not necessarily appointed by the previous reformist administration, uh, you know, they didn't like just roll over. So I'm, I'm, again, I'm saying there are reasons to be very worried. But don't be surprised that some people ending up there will actually try to do their job despite all of the difficulties. My bigger worry is, of course, on the revisionism, on some of the crazies out there who might use the Marcos victory to push for their own agenda, and kind of a fragmentation of the coalition and the craziest types coming on top. That's actually more my worry. But the other one is also in constitutional change. It really matters. I, I, I have a hard time seeing Bomo Marcos stepping down from office six years from now under Cory Aquino era constitution. I think a push for a constitution is almost inevitable, almost, again, there's some room for change there. But it matters what goes inside, because I'm sure some people would want to completely defang the Commission on Human Rights, completely defang the PCGG, which goes after ill-gotten wealth, among other things. So that's why the opposition has to be mobilized and make sure those things don't happen. And there are more centrist figures in the Senate uh, who might not necessarily be happy with the complete defanging of the last vestiges vestiges of liberal democracy. So what I'm saying is that let's not be fatalistic. And at the same time, let's also be open to at least some positive movements in the coming days and months, including on those three cases that I, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and we have to also encourage them moving in that right direction. But if you're gonna just paint the Marcoses as complete evil and all of that and alienate them, then you're encouraging their worst instincts perhaps. So some level of engagement is necessary. And my, I believe our partners, Americans, British, European Union, et cetera, will do also their part to nudge this new administration in the right direction. Other, other final uh, thoughts from the panelists? Please go ahead. Just a short one. So when I spoke about the fraying of the consensus post-86, it includes some of the institutions that were put into place, ideally, like to have a healthier democracy. And that includes, apart from the Commission on Human Rights, there were a couple of constitutional bodies, so including the Presidential Commission on Good Government. And on that one, I heard uh, Bong Bong Marcos say that he will keep it, but he said that it shouldn't go only, it should go about to about, uh, go after everyone who's, who's corrupt. Because the, the commission was established purely to, to recover the Marcos wealth. So there's a question now of like, what, what happens next? There are a, a lot of other, a couple of other things, but, um, but I think we're in a strange situation too, where it's like the chief executive's interests are not are in often in conflict with the interests of the state, you could say. So I think this is, uh, this is uncharted territory. I don't know if it's happened anywhere else. I mean, this, this graphically and, and at such a, the premier position of, uh, in the country. So I, that one, I don't know where it's gonna take us. But I do hope that there, I think that we kind of like at least say that uh, these, some of these things, they are not partisan. You know? They are not, uh, they are not, necessarily because you're pro Aquino. This, were, this was part of a historical period where people wanted these things in place, yeah. I think okay. just one, one last thing we could say is that uh, we can almost be sure that the Picasso painting will be back on Imelda's wall. Whether it's the real one or not, I don't know, but it looks like she's gonna be very comfortable to have it there if everyone can see it again. This is the painting that's disappeared, come back, disappeared, and I think was supposed to be confiscated by yeah. the- In 2014, they <laughs> raided. So they might have a copy, but it might not be the real one. Right. They may have gotten, they may have gotten the fake. <laughs> Any further? I'll pass it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, hanging in here to the end. I want to thank all our panelists for uh, uh, some great insights. Give them a round of applause. Uh, really appreciate people uh, taking time to uh, join us here at the club. If you like what you've heard, please uh, become a member of the FCCT. It, it's a great deal of fun. We have a lot of events going on. We have uh, a chess club coming in. We have uh, the pool tournament. 
we have uh, uh, quiz nights, we have all sorts of things. So uh, join if you're not a member. If you are a member, encourage your friends to join. Thank you very much and good night from Bangkok. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much.